Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. Today I wanted to go over some new lore that we got from the Iron Banner, which is lore from the perspective of Lord Saladin. Saladin has been a pretty prickly figure over the last year, and from his perspective, it's not hard to understand why. The Cabal return, and their now armistice with their new Empress Keitel, left Saladin looking at the rest of us like a bunch of naive fools, and frankly, you can understand why some of that feeling existed. Considering that the Cabal had previously almost destroyed the last city and Lord Saladin is not easily one to forgive. His relationship toward Crow in this time was one that could be best described as filled with animosity, with the two of them regularly sparring and locking horns as their views on many things clashed and broke against each other. Of course, none of this was helped either by what happened during the season of the Splicer, where the Elixni, who previously had been historical enemies of humanity were invited into the walls. Saladin was less than impressed, but opinions on the Elixni and the House of Light in particular changed as a result of the fact that they were helping to defend the city during the incursion of the Vex that was unleashed thanks to Lakshmi II and Savathun posing as Osiris. Of course, as things tend to do in Sol, all of Saladin's opinions changed. They changed with the revelation that Savathun had been posing as Osiris, indwelling within his form. The impact that this had, of course, on many characters has been profound. Saint-14 and Ikora, respectively, as Osiris's lover and apprentice, were undoubtedly most directly affected. But Osiris and Saladin had had several discussions that had brought them into close confidence over the last few months. I went over those again in that previous video. The shattering of the trust that had been built there, and the realization of the truth is undoubtedly going to have had an effect on Saladin. And in fact, we can even start to see some of that now. I talked in a previous video about Saladin's overt choices and changes as a result of Savathun's deception. These choices include allying, in some regards, with Keitel's Cabal, and choosing to set aside his old hatreds so that they might face a common enemy together. Today, however, I wanted to talk about much less overt changes that Saladin has undergone, and the choices he has made considering Crow in particular. All this lore comes from the lore of the new Iron Banner armor, the Iron Forerunner set, which tells us a lot about Saladin's past, some more moments with the Iron Lords, his training of Zavala, and his change in attitude toward the Crow. The general takeaway from all of this is that Saladin is in his own way ready to accept Crow as yet another student, and now looks to him with a sense of understanding. We're going to look at all this armor in order, but small note is that you can acquire this armor from the Iron Banner this season through the quest, and perhaps more importantly, you have the same lore on all characters regardless of class. The lore starts with the helmet, which reads as follows. Some know the legend. We threw ourselves on the blades of tyranny so others may live free. Lord Saladin. 1. Saladin remembers what it was like to be young. He remembers the exhilaration of discovering the infinite power he now holds in his hands. He remembers the terror, too. His first death and the agony of a ruptured lung. His mouth had been too full of blood to form words or plead with his ghost, so he tried with his eyes instead. Saladin remembers his second death because it was quicker than his first, a wrong step in a minefield outside of what used to be a city called Nur Sultan. He laughed when his ghost reassembled him. Then he cried. Saladin remembers deaths 3 through 65, but does not dwell on them. Instead, he regrets the thousands of hours of sleep lost to nightmares, and how much less vibrant his recollection of that period in his life is compared to his noble centuries as an Iron Lord. Saladin remembers the day he stopped counting deaths. Something about you is different, Yolda had said, and put her hand on his. Saladin remembers all this, and more when he looks at the crow, he feels rage form a hot pit in his belly when Osiris tells him about the young Lightbearer's suffering at the hands of fellow Guardians. Osiris asks him if he can keep a secret. I don't like secrets, Saladin says. And that's the end of it. 
A quick note before we start, Nur Sultan is actually the capital of Kazakhstan, which makes some sense and tells us vaguely where Saladin was resurrected. You see, Kazakhstan of course also contains the Baikonur Cosmodrome, as is found in Destiny today, just the Cosmodrome, and is also close to the site of the Iron Temple, or Fell Winter Peak as the Iron Lords would come to call it. This tells us vaguely where Saladin was resurrected, in the wilds of old Russia. And it also gives us a very interesting insight into the general way in which many of the Iron Lords must have formed, and the general place too. This look into Saladin's past, however, is something completely new. Never before has there been a moment at which we've been given an unfettered insight into the days before Saladin was an Iron Lord. These times were truly the beginnings of the Dark Ages, when the power of Guardians were new to the world, and the world around them was untamed. It's here, perhaps, that Saladin also sees something that he has in common with Crow, namely a traumatic early second life as a Guardian. Saladin remembers the vulnerability that he felt as a Lightbearer, who has only just been raised, and he now sees that this is something that Crow feels. It's something which he remembers with the bouts of insomnia, and I don't want to confirm this because it's not explicitly stated, but I feel as though this was a time at which Saladin felt a great deal of depression. The note that that time of his life is one that is remembered so much less vibrantly than his noble centuries as an Iron Lord is something that I think gives a rather large hint to that. This commonality that he has with Crow is not something that every Guardian shares. Take a look at our resurrection, for example. Yeah, we had to fight off a bunch of Elixni at the very beginning, we had to fight off a bunch of raiders, but it's not actually the case that we were in grave peril and we weren't continuously killed before we found safety and purpose. Crow and Saladin both were, and to an extent, this is one of the things, the many things in these few entries, that start to shape Saladin's opinion of Crow. Next we have the Iron Forerunner Gloves, which read as follows. Some know the legend. We were forged in the fires of a burning world. Lord Saladin. 2. Saladin remembers burying bodies by the dozen. He remembers being thankful that the ground had thawed earlier that year, so they wouldn't have to burn them. Fires brought light and smoke, and light and smoke brought fallen raiders. Fallen raiders brought more bodies. It's a vicious circle. Ephrodite had said as she tied off a funeral shroud with great care. Saladin remembers the bundle being very small. One day, I'm going to break it. Saladin remembers how easily the body fit in his arms, how light it felt as he laid it in the grave. He remembers, with shame, pretending not to hear Ephrodite's words so he wouldn't need to respond to them. He remembers not having anything kind to say. Saladin remembers all of this, and more whenever the crow talks back to him. Sometimes he bites down on the inside of his cheek. Sometimes he looks up to find his ghost focused on him with a knowing look. He doesn't say anything to his ghost either. Saladin here shows perhaps his age and how jaded he is. Lady Ephrodite, who most certainly was younger in spirit and far more idealistic than Saladin, was one to believe that such cycles of violence could one day be broken. Perhaps it's what led her to fight for the Iron Lords. Perhaps it's what led her to her current stance, where even as she still wields the light, she has retreated to a far-off colony of Guardians and chosen pacifism. The same idealism that Saladin saw in Ephrodite is probably the same idealism that he now sees in Crow, what with Crow's belief in reconciliation and peace, and his desire to make allies of the Elixni. Perhaps Crow is starting to show Saladin that such idealism can indeed have results. The House of Light stand firmly as allies of humanity, and perhaps now we can at least see one of the cycles of violence that Ephrodite sought to end being broken at last. After all, choosing peace is a hard choice to make, and it's a choice that you must make every day. But right now, at least, it's working. Next, we have the chest armor from Mayan Banner, which reads as follows. Some know the legend. 
We rose from the ashes of a dying world to save humanity from itself. Lord Saladin. Three. Saladin remembers losing his connection to the light. He remembers thinking that the Traveler must have discovered one of his most secret doubts. The darkest thoughts he shared with no one, not even his ghost. He remembers the strange sense of relief that had washed over him until his radio crackled to life just moments later. He remembers hearing a voice broadcast to the world that the last city had fallen to the Cabal, but he could not tell whose voice it was, only that it wasn't Zavala's. Saladin, his ghost had said, sounding like it spoke from the end of a very long, wide tunnel. You have to move! Because Saladin stood unmoving. He remembers staring out the window at flurries of snow for what felt like a very long time, but could only have been a few minutes. He remembers tracing the outlines of neighboring peaks across the glass with the edge of his knuckle. He remembers the act of remembering. Once upon a time, he'd taught their names to Zavala, as their names had been taught to him. Saladin, his ghost said again, and Saladin remembers moving. He remembers clutching his radio and rallying survivors, those strong enough to make the journey to the Iron Temple. Saladin remembers all this and more whenever Crow challenges him on his cowardice during the Red War. He wants to break the young Guardian's back to teach him a lesson about what it's like to feel helpless, but something stops him. He remembers hearing stories about Crow's life on the shore before he arrived at the tower, and does not raise a hand against him. How many doubts and regrets has Crow held? How many times has Crow sat and contemplated his purpose before being liberated from Spider's clutches? To be alone or to be cut off is in one way or another to be helpless, to be separated. But such weakness is not something that should be shamed, and it certainly isn't something that we should sit at and prod to. Everybody has a moment of weakness here or there. And understanding these moments of weakness when courage is not always enough to hold us and we just have to do all that we possibly can, well, these are moments that Saladin and Crow also have in common. Crow was unable to accomplish any purpose and was ultimately stuck in a place where he couldn't do more. He was on the shore, unable to stand as a guardian, unable to understand his purpose, unable to be as he was not quite the same as Saladin, who for years has understood his purpose, and when the light was snuffed out, decided to rally survivors at the Iron Temple instead of fighting. It's certainly not the same, but there is a degree to which that commonality of a moment of weakness can be understood. And again, I think it's something that Saladin almost understands with Crow. Next up we have the boots, something far cheerier than that last story, but it reads as follows. Some know the legend. We crossed a burning world with sword in hand, bringing justice and blood. Lord Saladin. 4. Saladin remembers the simple pleasure of sharing a meal with friends. He remembers Radagast hanging the deer upside down by its hind legs, and how swiftly Perun used her knife to skin it. He remembers Yolda tending the fire with wood cut by her favorite axe, a mighty thing fashioned from steel and embellished with engravings of laughing wolves. It had been a gift from a blacksmith whose son Yolda effortlessly plucked out of the frozen river several winters before. Putting an arrow through its heart is the easiest part, she'd teased him. Now you get to sit back and watch the rest of us do the real work. Saladin remembers helping anyway, using Yolda's axe to section off a flat piece of juniper to smoke the meat. He remembers the sound and smell of bubbling fat, and how rich the drippings had tasted when he soaked them in bread. He remembers Radagast asking him to sing the song taught to them by the people of the blacksmith's village, but agreeing only when Yolda and Perun promised to join in. Their voices rose like wolves in the night, and were so raw by morning that none of them could speak. Saladin remembers all this and more 
when Zavala tells him Amanda has taken Crow out to drink in the city's streets. He wonders what song they'll sing, if it's anything like the one he's heard everyone humming lately, even though he hasn't tried it himself. That song, of course, that everyone has been humming recently is another nod to Savathun's song, which again, Crow has been whistling, and lots of others have certainly been whistling. But I think there is a bigger message to take away from all of this, even if it is one of these moments where we are muddying this a little with Savathun's song. I think the takeaway from this is the importance of friendships, and I know that Saladin and Crow both having friends in common might seem like one of the least profound things to point to, but I think it's really nailing down what a friendship in this context means. Friendships are perhaps the most profound thing when it comes to trust. They represent a judgement of character, they represent a mutual presentation of vulnerability, and most of all they represent the trust that has been built. Just in the same way that Saladin and the other Iron Lords upheld their codes of honour as a judgement of what their character should be, Amanda judged Crow to be a hunter worthy of trust given his actions in the field during the Season of the Chosen. Just as Saladin was comfortable singing the songs with Pei Rune and Yolda, Crow was comfortable enough to get drinks with Amanda. Just as the Iron Lord's friendships built their trust, so too did Amanda and Crow's. That trust is important to Saladin, especially given the way that before he distrusted Crow, and now he is starting to understand him a little more. That trust is also very important when it comes from Amanda, and I think it tells us something that people tend to forget, which is, well, she may not be a guardian, but Amanda is empathetic and is also an excellent judge of character and of the situation, perhaps in a way that some guardians can't be, considering that she is mortal. Where others were concerned with the Cabal offensive in the Season of the Chosen, and whilst Amanda certainly did her part as a skilled pilot, she was also one who was concerned with the knowledge that there must be several transport ships of the Cabals loitering out in a safe, contained zone, which held all of their civilians unable to fight. Civilians that the Cabal had evacuated from Toro Battle. While others might be unwilling to immediately trust the Elixni, she was willing to go sparrow racing with one of them after trading knowledge back and forth about the mechanics of sparrows versus pikes. In both of these instances, kinship between us and the new party worked out. So why wouldn't it with Crow? Amanda is a good charge of character, and I think Saladin knows that. And I think more importantly, he's starting to understand that Crow is somebody who one day he might be able to sing songs with. Finally, we've got the lore on the class item, which is by far the most fascinating piece of lore in the whole bunch because it provides a little context on a topic that so many people have asked me about over the years but there's never been a concrete answer to. And this gives us a somewhat reasonable answer, which isn't exactly concrete and could have textures of context added to it, but hey, for the moment we might have an answer to it. What is that question? Well, I think it'll become fairly obvious. The lore tab gives us more context to the relationship between Commander Zavala and Lord Saladin, and it reads as follows. Some know the legend. We crushed the warlords beneath our heel so that they may never rise again. Lord Saladin. 5. Saladin remembers the first time he met Zavala. He remembers thinking that the Awoken had regal bearing, like the stags he once hunted on the steppes. His shoulders were broad, and his chin held high. When he moved, he did so with the strength and purposeful deliberation of someone with the power to determine his own place in the world. You'll never have a son, his ghost had said, but it isn't too late for you to take an apprentice. Saladin remembers their sparring matches. He remembers how Zavala always got back on his feet, no matter how many times Saladin put him down. He remembers refusing to offer the younger Lightbearer a hand up, until the day Zavala finally bested him in combat. He remembers lying flat on his back, left shoulder dislocated and ribs shattered, a strange pressure on his chest that had made it difficult to breathe. Finish it. Saladin had commanded, because that was the way of things. His ghost would revive him. Saying nothing, Zavala hauled him to his feet instead. 
Saladin remembers all this and more when his former apprentice calls him into his office and tells him about the face behind Crow's mask. Zavala says he knows that Saladin doesn't like secrets, that it's unfair to ask him to keep one of this magnitude. But there will come a time when the Crow needs someone the way Zavala needed Saladin. You never needed anyone, Saladin insists. Zavala only smiles. Saladin knows who Crow was. Saladin knows what the Guardian has done in his first life. Saladin knows everything now. He is being asked by Zavala not only to keep that secret, but to stand as Crow's mentor when the time is right. But Saladin knows that Crow is strong enough to take on any challenge that faces him. This is perhaps one of the ultimate acknowledgements of the trust that Saladin can give. When every guardian must stand as a bulwark against corruption in the world, and when that darkness requires each of us to be a bastion and a sword at once, Saladin now sees Crow as strong enough to fulfill that role. It also perhaps speaks to Crow's character, that Saladin would see him as comparable to Zavala in this way. A wise leader knows when to leave the enemy room to retreat. A wise leader knows that there is strength in offering a hand to a fallen foe that they might rise and stand at your side. This is exactly what Zavala did, and it speaks to a sort of unimpeachable moral character that he holds. I think Saladin is saying here that not only was that strength of moral fiber something that Zavala always had, but it's also something that Crow has too. In this sense, Saladin will be here for him, but he knows that he doesn't need it. He knows that Crow does not need him at all. This is Saladin acknowledging Crow's worthiness in a certain way, in spite of who he was in his past life. Of course, there's also a very important revelation given here generally by Saladin's ghost, which is a sort of tacit confirmation of something that I think we've never truly seen addressed. If I'm reading into this correctly, guardians can't have children. Bunchy's definitely had this question floating around a whole bunch, and this is perhaps their way of answering that question. It does make a degree of sense after all, in terms of kindness as far as storytelling is concerned. Immortal god slayers making children is one thing, but there's a terrible cruelty in allowing some to live on while they watch their children die. Zavala feels the pain of watching his mortal partner pass away, as was discovered in the lore from the season of the Splicer. Zavala, in this sense, has already seen his love fade from his life. Though his love might be gone, he keeps her memory with him. But that is still a painful practice, as much as he still cares. Similarly, I can only imagine the heartbreak that every Guardian might feel when losing a child, something every Guardian would have to experience if they chose to. And so perhaps this is for the best, even if it puts a halt to anyone's speculation. I do grant, however, that this does leave Bungie with some sort of wiggle room if they want to change their minds later. There's no specific reason given as to why Saladin can't have a child, and perhaps there is some reason they could go ahead and throw in there. Anything from it's a specific condition that he has, to simply Saladin believing that his duty as an Iron Lord and as a protector means that he should not have the time for such things. But either way, it seems like Bungie has quite subtly drawn that line in the sand. Maybe that is the case, maybe it's not. With all of that said, I think that brings us to a close today. Saladin knows about Crow's past, and has accepted it, and we now know perhaps a little bit more about the question of whether Guardians can indeed create little Guardians. Anyway, that's all from me for now. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and let me know down below in the comments section, and remember, you can also leave a like. And if you want more Destiny lore, go ahead and hit subscribe, and the bells next to subscribe as well. Go ahead and turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.